Hi guys and welcome to today's video on functions and modeling exercises part of this methods one and two course. Really good to see you here. Functions and modeling, what well, sounds complicated. Well, not really. If you can ultimately work out the difference between when a question and yes, yeah, sadly worded questions, Barry's at it now, it's gonna throw some tricks in. But when they're dealing with linear, hybrid or quadratic functions, that's ultimately what we're dealing with. And up until this point in the course, We've dealt with a lot of functions, we've done a bit of transformations, we've done a lot of work on quadratics. Now being able to extract from questions what it is you are doing, as in a linear equation or whatever else, sort of narrows down the tools you're going to use. And I'm going to go through three examples here taken from the Cambridge uh, methods textbook that Cambridge have very kindly allowed me to use your examples for. So thank you. Now guys, I am Darren, otherwise known as the Maths Guru, and it is always good to see you here. If you are new, then welcome. Thanks very much. Over there in the corner is a little red arrow uh, that's pointing to a subscribe button for my YouTube channel. Um, you subscribing lets me know that you are watching or that the people are actually watching and that sitting in this room on my own talking to myself isn't actually a complete waste of my time. So thank you so much. Um, I love making maths fun and hopefully I will make it interesting for you. Now, functions and modeling actually is the last part of this course. Um, and it's going to build on all that stuff. As I just said a moment ago, there are worded questions here, much of which you don't really need to know about, but you do need to understand which section of the course it's applying to. And so believe it or not, I'm going to go straight into some examples. Video shouldn't take too long, but here we go. Example one, a book club has a membership fee of $60. And each, per uh, each book purchased is $10. Construct a cost function. Oh, hold on a moment. Cost function. Well, no, this is a cost function that can be used to determine the cost of a different numbers of books and then sketch its graph. Okay, so we're obviously talking about changing the number of books. Very quickly, when we have uh, axes, the thing that we change tends to go on the bottom of a set of axes. The things that change as a result tend to go on the vertical part. All right, so these are called the explanatory and response variables or the independent and dependent, all sorts of different terminology. Now that fits a little bit outside this video, but sometimes it's good to know the language before we actually start. Okay, so we've got the number of books and what other variable or what other thing are they actually dealing with? Will it appear to be cost? So I could put C there, but I'm going to slightly amend that in a moment because we need a cost function. If you remember from particular graphs previously, we had things like f of x, and that was a function. Now, what it meant was we had some sort of graph, and it had something to do with my x value. It was the x values that were changing that then ultimately created my y value. So when we do a cost function or we have a function, we generally have some sort of letter some sort of brackets and a letter inside those brackets to help us sort of work out what's being related to what. Now, bearing in mind the cost of my books relate to the number of books that I'm being bought, then I'm going to write that as C and in brackets N. Okay, so we have a fixed fee here. Now, again, if you're a, a taxi user, whenever you get into your taxi, they're going to charge you a fee before you even leave. That's called a flat fee. You're going to pay that regardless of how far you go. And so that's going to be important to me. So my membership fee is going to be $60. But then what happens if I don't buy any books? Well, it's going to charge me $60. What if I buy one book? Hopefully it's going to be $70. And two books is going to be $80. And three books is going to be $90. And so it goes on. Now, because my um, amounts are going up by fixed amounts each time, because you know it's going up by tens each time, then obviously this is a linear function. And so to create my linear function, drawing it slightly larger, let's rub this one out over here to make it a bit easier for me. Here is gonna be my C of M, and here is my N value. Now, we can buy no books. We can't buy minus books, and we need to be very careful there, but we could buy no books, one book, two books, three books, four books, five books. Now, obviously, to be perfectly honest with you, joining a book club and not paying anything seems, uh, paying, uh, not buying any books seems a bit stupid, but anyway. So when we have no books, we charge $60. That's our fixed fee. One book would be $70, so I'm gonna put a cross here, and two books would be 80, and then 90, and then 100, and 110. And lo and behold, ladies and gentlemen, my graph would effectively do this. Now, I'm gonna put an arrow on the end of there. 
The reason I'm putting an arrow on it is because theoretically that graph could go on and on and on to infinity and beyond. I'm not sure how I'm going to buy an infinite number of books, but anyway. What it can't do is it cannot go backwards into the negative numbers. And it is so important when you draw graphs to actually think about what it is you're doing. Always think, can I have a negative something, right? And, and I'm going to come up with an example of that in a, in, a, in a moment. But believe it or not, there we go. There is my graph. I've sketched it, but it wants a cost function. In other words, it just wants you to write a formula that now describes that graph. So moving up a little bit, we now know that a cost function is given by, well, we could write it in y equals mx plus c form, so let's do that. So um, we know that our form is y equals m gradient. If I work out the gradient, it's going to be 10 times my x value, which is n, and I'm going to add on to that 60. That would be perfectly acceptable. Uh, interestingly, the textbook, the Cambridge textbook, actually has it as 60 plus 10n. Either of those are absolutely acceptable because they are both correct. Yes, as long as you've got the 10 times the n added to the 60, then I would personally give you the marks. And lo and behold, there is my cost function. That linear, uh, that was a linear relationship. In example two, the following table shows the Unadnithian post rate. I've got no idea where that is. I hope they've made that up. Because uh, anyway, it's got post rates for sending letters. We love sending letters. Although, funnily enough, not many people do. There we go. So we've got this information here. And then it says sketch a graph of the cost function C. OK, we know what a cost function is now. Giving its domain and range and the rules that define it. Oh, OK, giving its domain and range and the rules that define it. Right, OK, so. First things first, what do you notice? We've got mass against cost. Right, so I can actually sketch this. Thank you very much. So it's mass against cost. So we've got mass in grams and we've got our cost uh, in dollars for... Our... Now, actually, I'm not going to write that dollars because that doesn't make any sense. Remember, we're looking for the value that's changing. So whereas before we had the N, now I'm going to have C... And in this case, M, because my cost is going to change with the value of the mass. Right, OK, so up to 50 grams, it's giving me 70 cents as a cost. Right, so I'm going to have 50, 100, uh, 150, 200, 250, 300. My graph isn't going to be long enough. So let's keep going. So we've got 50, 100, 150, 200, 250, 300. Ooh. 350, 400, 450, and 500 grams. Thank you so much. And our costs seemingly go up to $3. So there is three, and there is two, and there is one, and there is zero dollars. All right, okie dokie. So up to 50 grams. Mm, now, the big question we're going to face here is, is this a linear? Is it hybrid or is it quadratic? Well, hopefully all of you are going to say, oh, it's a hybrid function because we've got different costs for different masses, but the costs seem to stay the same. Good answer if you came up with hybrid. Up to 50 grams is going to include 50 grams. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. We know it's 70 cents. So I'm actually going to draw a line between there, and I'm going to say that's 0 0.70. And here's a question. Whenever we draw a hybrid function, or in fact many functions in maths, we have to make sure whether the endpoints are defined or not. Now in this situation, because it says up to 50 grams, I'm actually going to draw a colored in circle there because it includes the 50 grams. But what about zero grams? Is it sensible to walk in and be charged 70 cents for a zero gram letter? That would effectively mean you've walked into the post office, blown on the scale, <laughs> And they've gone, all right, thanks very much, that's 70 cents. Hold on a moment, I haven't, there's nothing there. <laughs> that's another 70 cents, stop blowing, all right. <laughs> so the point of it is, that would make no sense to actually include zero. So we actually do that as an open circle. And these things are actually critically important in methods. They're the type of thing, sadly, that lose people marks. All right, over 50 grams, which means it's not included, up to 100 grams is $1.15. So Let's draw my line between 50 and 100. So there's 50 and 100. So which is 50 included? No, it isn't. So there's my open circle. But we know that 100 grams is included, filled in circle. God, this stuff's awesome. $1.70 over 100 grams up to 250. Right. So what do we say? $1.70. Let's say roughly speaking there. 
all the way over to $2.50, which is there. There's my straight line. So we are not including that open circle, but we are including that closed circle. And finally, over 250 grams and up to 500 grams. So we're not going to include the 500 grams. Here is my straight line. And here is my open circle. And here is my closed circle, all right, up to and including 500 grams. That's a funny thing, and then I just said it didn't include 500, but it does. And there we go, ladies and gentlemen, we have drawn my graph of the cost function. All right, so giving its domain and range and the rules that define it. Now, we've got to come up with an actual cost function. So the way we do this now is I'm going to say, well, C of M is equal to, and we draw... Yeah, now remember, this is a hybrid function, so we have to draw that curly thing. And now we're literally going to split that up into costs and domains. Right, so the cost of the first one was 70 cents. And what did that go between? It went up to and including 50 grams, but not zero. So here is zero, and we've got mass. And we notice that we have now our, you know, what that less than or equal to sign? There we go. So M is less than or equal to 50 but it is greater than zero. So there's that one. So the rest should be relatively easy. 1.15 for over 50 grams and up to and including 100 grams. What did we go then? We had $1.70 for uh, 100 grams not included and then 250 grams and then $3 to give me uh, 250 and less than or equal to 500. Now, when I took this to my group, we had a huge debate about where the less than or equal to sign goes. Just make it consistent. The question will try and help you. Very, very important there, yes? Does that make sense? Is that my full answer? I should Coco. Ah, uh, but it isn't. Because again, the question said, sketch a graph of the cost function giving its domain and range and the rules that find it. Believe it or not, this is only the rules that define it. The question wanted our actual domain and range. Right, okay, so domain. What values was my function defined for in a domain? Well, it seemed to be all values from zero to 500, but not including zero. So zero to 500, there is my square bracket. And what about my range? Now again, this is a trick. Not all of my values were defined for the range. We get so used to in maths, there being sort of a join between them all and yeah, we'll just do the lowest value or the highest value, but this is a huge trick here. So the range actually needs to be written with a set of curly brackets and we've had 0.70, 1.15, 1.7, and 3.00 with curly brackets. That's just a set of numbers. We don't do the round brackets because that would include all of them. We don't do the square brackets because it's not an interval. So in this situation, our range can only take those four specific values. And we'd need to make sure that we put the curly brackets in to make that clear. Right, so we've now dealt with a linear and a hybrid function. I think there's only one left and that would be my quadratic function. And so this type of question you can see behind me now is used so often in mathematics. Not the actual question, but very, very similar. We're forever putting things in fences or putting fences around things. And generally speaking, that fence will either butt on to a hedge or something, in which case you're only gonna look at three sides because if there's already an existing structure, you're only looking for those three sides or they're going to enclose everything, in which case you're looking for four sides. So let's look at the question. A householder has six laying eggs. With all due respect, who cares? It's trying to trick you before you even start. It's trying to deflect you from the important stuff. Not interesting. And wishes to construct a rectangular enclosure. That's the first part that's actually important, to provide a maximum area for the hens. To provide a maximum area for the hens, that's the important part as well. Maximum area using 12 meter length of fencing. All right, 12 meter length of fencing wire. Thank you very much. Construct a function that will give the area of the enclosure in terms of its length L. Okay, so they're giving me some information now. Area's got to be defined by the letter A and the length has to be defined by the letter L. Sketch a graph and find the maximum area. Seems like a lot of stuff in here. But I'm going to tell you now, these questions are so formulaic, it's almost a joke. As soon as you know it's a quadratic, you know your graph is either going to look like an N shape or it's going to look like a U shape. And for most of these questions that deal with fences and stuff, it's going to be an N shape. Because how would you know? What was it in the question that gave you that hint? 
it was the word maximum area. So for it to have a maximum, it has to be an end shape. So I'm gonna sort of sketch over here an end shape. Now the thing about maths is knowing where you're going. I suppose it's like getting in your car. If you know where you're gonna go when you get in your car, you're gonna head in the right direction. In this question, knowing I've got a quadratic, I'm looking at that type of function, and there's two things that's going through my head. To be able to draw a graph, I need to know x-axis intercepts, and I need to know turning points. Once I know that information, the rest of the question just becomes a breeze. So, let's first things first. It says that we have a rectangular enclosure. We know the area inside of it is A, and we know that the uh, length is given by L. I don't really care which one is the length. I'm gonna write it as capital L rather than that little L because that little L just becomes, looks like an E in my handwriting. So we know the total perimeter of this was equal to 12 meters, yes? How do I find my missing side? Because if I'm gonna find an area of a rectangle, what two things do I need? I need, that's it, I need a length and I need a height. Once I know those two things, life is much, much easier. Right, so we've got a length. So I need to find this height here. Well, we know the whole thing is 12 meters. So if I now split this across the diagonal, if you remember with perimeter, if we know that that is L, we know that these two things must be half of the perimeter. So I know that the length of those two sections there must make 12. So half of it would be six, and so that would be six minus L. And I've got literally now the hardest part of my question done with, believe it or not. Okay, so the first thing is find a, fu a function that will give the area of the enclosure. So I know the area of the enclosure is given by six minus L times L, and there we go. One mark in an exam, job done. Now again, it's at this point that people start to fritz because they're like, oh, okay, and then it's a sketch a graph, find the maximum area. When you're sketching a graph of a quadratic, what do you need to know? You need to know these x-axis intercepts. And whenever you're finding x-axis intercepts, what rule are you going to use? Well, you're gonna use the null factor law. You need to factorize something to get it and use a null factor law to find those crossing points. Many times, these questions here actually help you without realizing and it. it tests the people who understand against the people who regurgitate. And so what am I trying to tell you here? Well, by trying to find this, we know that here is the length of L and here is the length of A. What do we know about the value of A on that line? It's equal to zero. So we're finding the variant values there where A is zero. So moving this up a bit, I know that zero is equal to six minus L times L. And if you can see that that's already in factorized form, your job's done for you. That means literally L is zero or six minus L equals zero. So L is six, whoa! So I can now, making it slightly bigger, hoping my head's not in the way, know that there is L, there is my value of A, I have a crossing point at zero, and I now have a crossing point at six. I know that it's got to be a maximum, so, oh, that was, that was ropey. Let's try that one again. <laughs> and we know that my graph has to look like that, and it's going to have a turning point here. Oh, this stuff is awesome. We know the turning point is halfway between those x values, so I now know that an L of three gives me this value here. So I know that's three comma, but how on earth do I find what that y value is? Oh, I don't know. Oh, is there a formula I can, oh, there is a formula I can use. Because I know that area was equal to six minus L times L. So six minus three is three, times it by three gives me nine. And ladies and gentlemen, Pretty much, there you go, that's it. You've found all the information you need to. All you've got to do now is answer the question. By sketching a graph, have we sketched the graph? We have, thank you very much. Find the maximum area that can be fenced. I would just need to say, therefore, the maximum area is equal to nine square meters. Now, why is it square meters? Because it told you here it was 12 meters in length. You must, must make sure that your units are correct. Ladies and gentlemen, believe it or not, that is the end of this particular lesson.
Thank you so much for watching. These three examples, hopefully they've been useful to you. A linear, a hybrid function, and a quadratic. If you can get the general idea of the, what you're taking out of the question, it shouldn't be particularly difficult. Now, if you can over there, there is a doohickey for you to subscribe if you haven't already done so. Get a couple of friends. I'm desperately trying to get to a thousand subscribers. Otherwise, there is a video loading below from the methods one and two course for you as well. Go and watch it. It might be very, very helpful to you. Otherwise, you have an awesome day. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. This is Maths Guru signing out. Take care. Bye-bye.